Uh, it was a few years ago that Ashley and Jason took their two young boys, Logan, eight years old, Riley, four years old, took them out to eat with a few other family members. And once they finally got to the table after a long wait, little Riley, four years old, began throwing a fit. He was getting pretty frustrated. He was tired. He was, he was hungry. He was angry. He was hangry. Anybody ever been there? Any, any hangry people? I'm not asking if you are now, like bear with me. We got a little bit to go here. We got stretch. Just keep giving yourself to it. But that made it a little worse, right? Because he's four years old and, you know, a hangry four-year-old can be tough to console. But to make matters worse, he's got some special needs. He deals with epilepsy. He's nonverbal. He's got several other complications. So when the waitress approached their table um, with the look in her eyes and uh, tear-filled eyes, they were afraid they were going to be told either console him or you got to go because it was getting a little bit disruptive for other people. But what the waitress told them was, hey, there's a gentleman here in the restaurant. He and his family want to bless you and provide for your meal. And they said, order the most expensive thing and get dessert too. It's all on them because God only gives special boys like that to special families like yours. Now, what a blessing that was for that family. What a beautiful blessing. That anonymous guy blessed them in more profound ways than he could probably imagine with more than just a physical provision of food, but a spiritual provision of sustenance and encouragement for them. Now, you may have been at a place or a time when you've had somebody provide a meal for you or you've maybe had to miss a meal. And most of us, when we get hangry, right, if we miss a meal, it's probably not gonna be the end of our lives. Although if you're hanging out with the Fitz fam and we get hangry, you're probably gonna wonder who's gonna kill who. It, it, there's gonna be a loss of life in the Fitz fam when we, get, when we get like that. But you know, for most of us, we might actually benefit from missing a meal or two if we're really honest with ourselves. But that does not diminish the blessing that it is when somebody provides a meal for us or the blessing we receive when we get to provide a meal for someone else. And today, we're jumping into week 16 of Quest 52. It's the devotional we're using in our pursuit of Jesus this year. It's the guy that's helping us dig into God's word, the Bible, to get to know Jesus better. If you don't yet have a copy of this, you can pick up a discounted copy for yourself and some discounted copies to share with friends as well. We encourage you, don't just read this on your own. Read it in connection with others. Join a small group. Get some friends together. Talk about it throughout the week. But the question we're looking at today and that I hope to provide some answers for is this, can Jesus provide for my needs? Because we've all wondered that at some point, can Jesus really provide for the needs in my life? And today we're going to dig into Mark chapter 6 to find the answer to that. But the spot we're going to start with gives us a little context for what's going on. Mark chapter 6 verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Jesus had sent his followers, sent his disciples out in pairs, two by two, on this ministry assignment. He'd sent them out to teach and preach the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. And they had returned to him, and they were telling him all the good that they'd seen, that they had been teaching, and they had been preaching this good news, but they had also been healing people and casting out demons. And they were like, God was doing this through us. And they had seen God do those things through Jesus, but now they were the, the conduits of God's power. Now they were recipients of all that was going on, and they were just so excited. So we have that going on with the disciples, his followers, but at the same time, while they were out on the ministry assignment, Jesus had received word that his good friend and his cousin, John, we know him as John the Baptist, better known maybe as John the Baptizer or John the Immerser, that's what his name really means, John the Immerser, that he'd gotten on the bad side of the king's wife because he was calling out the king and his wife for some unholy behavior. And that doesn't get you in good standing with royalty, and so he got himself in trouble with the king's wife and the king, and he got himself beheaded. So Jesus' friends have been out on ministry assignment, teaching and healing. You know, we, we got guys who were fishermen, a tax collector, who were turned into preachers and healers. And they come back, and they're so excited for what God's been up to. And Jesus is mourning, grieving the loss of his buddy. 
He's grieving the brokenness of a world that esteems crooked kings and kills good men like John. So in that context, Jesus says to him, let's go off by ourselves. Let's find a quiet place. Let's rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles did not even have time to eat. That's a big deal. I hate those days. Anybody with me? It's like you're working so hard and there's so much busyness and you miss lunch. That's not good for me because it's really not good for the people who have to meet with me after I've missed lunch. But they're so busy, Jesus can't even get lunch. His buddies can't get lunch. So they left by boat for a quiet place. And I know what some of you are thinking. Your boat is your quiet place. You get on the water, you're fishing, you're doing your stuff on the lake, and I get it. The boat is a quiet place. Well, they went off where they could be alone for a while. But many people recognized them. They saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got to that place they were going ahead of them. They just couldn't get a break. And when Jesus and the guys arrived there, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat. And he had compassion on them. Keep that in mind. Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Now here's Jesus, he's tired, he's hungry, he's been pressed by the crowds on and on and on, again and again. He's grieving the loss of a friend, he's trying to talk to his disciples about all they had experienced, and the crowds just come at him again. And, and what does Jesus do? Does he send him away and say, like, hey listen, I need some alone time, just back off. Can you give me some space? I need some personal space, I need some alone time, just time out, get away from me. No. With compassion, he gives them what they need. He begins teaching them. And I love this picture of Jesus who himself is hurting. He's grieving. He's sad. But he recognizes they need. So he gives of himself to them. And he begins teaching them. And as would often happen, he would teach for quite a while. Because the people hung on every word. And again, I wish Mark told us, all the things Jesus taught that moment. I really wish we get to know what he was teaching them. We don't, we don't. But we do know that late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, hey, this is a remote place. It's getting pretty late in the day. Why don't you send those crowns away so they can go to the nearby farms, they can go to the villages, they can get something to eat. Now, we can read into this. Jesus, why don't you send them away to get something to eat? <clears throat> we haven't even had time to eat ourselves. Like, how about... We send them away, maybe we have time to eat, we're kinda hungry. Now maybe, maybe they had had some food in the boat on the way over there, maybe they had carved some time for that, maybe we, we don't know exactly the situation, but we do know this. The disciples were ready to call it a day, but Jesus was not yet done giving the people what they needed. So Jesus said, oh, you want me to send them away? No, 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 no. You feed them. You feed them. With what, they said. We'd have to work for months to have enough resource, to have enough money to buy the food for all these people. How are we supposed to feed them? We don't have that kind of money. We don't have that kind of time. But what are we going to do? You want us to spend money? We don't have that money. So Jesus said to him, how much bread do you have? Go and find out. Well, they came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. We got a Lunchable. We got thousands of people. We got a huge crowd. We got a Lunchable. We got... We have some leftover Ritz crackers and a can of sardines. There you go. What do you want to do? Like these loaves of bread are not big loaves of bread. These are like small, like single serving, like pan pizza kind of size things, right? This is not a lot of food. So the disciples are like, we just don't have enough. Well, Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So the people sat down in groups of 50 or 100. And then Jesus took the five loaves. He took the two fish. He looked up to heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples. He kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. And I love what comes next. They all ate as much as they wanted. Now, the translation here, we might better translate it a little more accurately. They ate until they were full. Like they weren't like gluttonous, but they ate until they were full. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. We're talking several thousand people were fed from this. Did you notice what led to that? 
Jesus told the disciples, the disciples said, hey, listen, send the people away. They're going to get hungry. No, you feed them. You provide them some food. And, and what Jesus is saying is not just, hey, find out how much food there is. Collect all the food. Let's make this happen. Hey, you got to go spend your money. By Jesus is trying to remind them of what they've just been up to. Jesus is trying to remind them, listen, I sent you out on a ministry journey, on a ministry assignment. You taught. You preached. You healed, you cast out demons, you saw God at work through you. And all those things that you've just witnessed him do through you, guess what? This is not outside of the realm. You trust God to do something here in this moment. But they did not yet have eyes to see that. They were stuck looking at the physical problems in front of them that they could not see the spiritual opportunity. And so often that's what happens to us. They just couldn't see the opportunity They were thinking in scarcity. They were thinking of limitations. And they forgot that God is a God of unlimited blessing. And God is the God of abundance. Happens to us sometimes, doesn't it? So often, we're afraid that if we give what we have, we'll just lose whatever we have. If we give what we have, we're going to lose it all. We don't have enough to give. We cling to what little provision we have afraid of putting it in God's hands. But what we learn with God is this, that whatever we have, no matter how small it might be, whatever we have in our hands will become more than enough when we trust it in God's hands. Whatever limited resources you have, when you put it in God's hands, it is more than enough for God to do what he needs to do to bless others, but also to bless you. God will do incredible things through it, but you've got to you got to relinquish your control. So often we cling so tightly to the things we have. We, we hold it with this death grip, this white knuckle approach, afraid that if we loosen our grip, it's going to slip away from us, and then we won't have. We do that with our kids, those of us who are parents, not sure about our kids' future. We cling to it. Some of you, your kids have expressed a desire to maybe pursue ministry, and you're like, man, I don't know. Like, how you, how you provide, how you do, like... Like God won't take care of them. You're like, well, maybe you should go into business. Maybe you should go into, and and you just cling so tightly. We, We cling so tightly to the things we have. For most of us, food is not often the issue. But I know what is. You know what is. Because I read the same news you do. I see the same stories. I see the same reports from my financial advisor on my retirement accounts. I I know that money is one of the greatest struggles most of us have. And we cling so tightly, afraid that it's going. But listen, you live in America. Don't worry, the government will just print more. You're good. good. (laughs) Sorry. Another lesson for another time. Another lesson, another time. So we get scared, right? Because we know the problems with that, right? Like, oh my goodness. And it's scary because we're like, great, the government is in control of some of what might happen. with, And it causes us to cling tight. Here's the deal. When you cling so tightly, you ever try to grab a hold of something when your hands are like this? Like when you're already clutched, you, you just can't receive. And what you cling to limits you to what you already have. You can't get any more. You're stuck in this zone. But when you open up, when you relinquish control, guess what? What you have is it might, might come out of your hand but a whole lot more might come into it. So whatever you have is more than enough when you put it in God's hands. Five loaves, two fish becomes the biggest buffet you've ever seen, the greatest all-you-can-eat meal in the history of humanity. A Lunchable becomes enough for thousands of people. He continued to put it in the disciples' hands so they could continue to distribute and they all, including the disciples, ate their fill. No, so that doesn't mean you give all your money to God and you'll be rich and like, oh yeah, man, if I give it to God, then I get to drive a, a Ferrari because he blessed me like that. Like, no, that's not how God's blessing works. He will make you rich of soul. He will give you peace. He will make you rich with the stories of being in partnership with him as he blesses others through you. And you will be totally taken care of. You need not worry about putting it in his hands. But if you cling too tightly, 
you will miss out not only on the blessing of helping others, but on the blessing of what God wants you to receive. So church, here's the deal. Open those hands, trust it to God. Trust his provision for you and through you. Whatever you have is more than enough when you put it in his hands. Well, immediately after Jesus feeds all those people with a can of sardines, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida. And he said, you guys go in the boat, you go back there, and I'm gonna send the people home. So after telling everyone goodbye, bye-bye, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. I think Jesus was getting time to do what he originally set out to do all along, what he'd actually wanted to do with his day. He was sad at the loss of a friend. He wanted to get some alone time with God the Father and grieve, to sit in the sadness, to lament, and to remind himself that that's not the end of the story. Jesus was fully God, but he was fully human. He felt the feels we feel. And so, late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. And he looked down in the water. He saw that they were in serious trouble. They were rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. A storm was brewing against them. Not the first time they've been in a storm. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them. Isn't that great news? That Jesus comes to us, even in the storm. We're struggling in life and Jesus comes and he meets us where we are and he'll do whatever he takes. He'll break through whatever barriers he has to break through to make it happen. He walked on the water to get to them. (laughs) He's gonna break through whatever you need him to break through to get to you if you are moving in the direction he's asked you to go. But check this out. He intended to go past them. Now, that translation of that right there, I I don't love. I, I think we we can capture that in a little bit better language. And I love the New Living Translation. That we use the New Living Translation, I use it here because it's an accurate translation and it's one of the easiest for all of us to understand. That's why we use the New Living Translation. But the New American Standard, just like all the translations, you have people translating from one language into another. Sometimes there's a little bit better way, a little way to nuance it a little bit more. The New International Version, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard translate this a little more accurately. He intended to pass them by, to pass them by. And that language is the same language used in Exodus 33, 19. What Mark is using here in his gospel is the same language that's used in Exodus 33, 19. And that's a passage where God passes by Moses. God and Moses had been having this interaction. They were dialoguing with each other. God, Moses had met with God on a mountaintop, but God was veiled. He was there, but his presence, his full presence was veiled from Moses. So Moses is interacting with God, but not exactly looking in God's face. And in this, God tells Moses, Moses, you have my favor on you. My favor rests upon you, Moses. My presence will always go with you. Moses, I know you by name. This is this beautiful passage, Exodus 33, so rich in meaning, not just for Moses, not just for the Israelites of his time, but for all of us who follow God. I I encourage you to look it up sometimes, spend some time in Exodus 33. It's this beautiful picture of, of interacting with God. So he has this remarkable, Moses has this remarkable interaction with God, and it's this beautiful thing filled with so much richness. And then Moses makes this bold request of God, and he says, God, show me your glory. I want to see you in your glory. And God says, oh, okay, what? You want to see my glory? Well, nobody can see the fullness of my glory and live because it's too much for you. So God responds to Moses this way. He says, I will make all my goodness pass by you. And I will call out my name, Yahweh, the Lord, before you. I'll pass by you, and I'll give you my name. I'll call my name. So Moses says, show me your glory. God gives him a twofold response. First, I'll make my goodness pass before you. And the word Mark uses in his gospel for pass by is the same language used in this passage in the Septuagint. That I know we're getting a little geeky here. Just stick with me. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. So just like most of us don't speak Hebrew or Greek, and we don't read it, right? Anybody in here proficient Hebrew? Right. So we read it in the English. We trust other people to translate it for us. Well, most of the people in Jesus' time, a lot of those people did not necessarily speak in the time after, right? Did not speak that. So there's a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And the same passage, the same word in the Septuagint used in Exodus for pass by is the same word that Mark uses in his gospel. The word is perarchomai. 
Pererkomai. Say it with me. Pererkomai. Say it again. Pererkomai. It's just fun word to say. There's no point in saying it, so it's just fun. So it's, the word means to pass by. And it's this concept that God will pass by. And so when Jesus is there on the water intending to pass by them, it's a picture of God's glory coming. Now, we use similar language. We use similar language, right? Because if you tell somebody to come over to the house, say, hey, come on over, come by at whatever time, right? Oh, come on by. Oh, I'll stop by. No, oh, I'll swing by to pick you up. I'll be by your house at such and such time. We, we use similar language. And this is the language of coming by, not just I'm gonna walk by and give you no attention. I will pass by and you will see me in this moment. So God is revealing himself to Moses. Or sorry, well, he did reveal himself to Moses. Here, Jesus, as God, is revealing himself to the disciples. So we return to Mark's gospel. When they saw Jesus walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. Because you don't have a bucket in your brain for, hey, we're in the midst of a storm. The winds and the waves are just pummeling us. Oh, here comes our buddy walking through the storm waters, right? Like, you just don't, and like, so they don't have a bucket for what Jesus is doing. And they're all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of me. That's me. Take courage. I am here. So the physical struggle they had to make headway in the storm is also a metaphor for their struggle to understand just who Jesus is. The disciples had been spending tons of time with Jesus, and they still didn't fully grasp who he is. And it scares me as a pastor, to be really honest with you. It's just you can come here week after week. You can do all the ABFs and hear all the sermons. You can come year after year, decade after decade. You'd be in the small groups. You'd do Rooted. Any of my Rooted peeps? Woo! All right, if you're not done Rooted, it's kicking up in a few weeks. Sign up. It is worth it. Like you'd do all the stuff. That you can group and you serve. You do all that stuff. And you can get close in proximity to Jesus and to Jesus' people. You read all about him, have all the information and you still miss who he is. So Jesus' invitation is not just to know about him, it's to know him. To know him as friend, to know him as rescuer of your soul, to know him as Lord and King of kings who deserves your allegiance and your worship, but to know him, not just know about him. And just like the disciples in that moment, man, we can be so close and just not get it. Church, my prayer for you is that that would never be you. But that, that, that's why we're doing what we're doing this year. That's why I encourage you to jump into this and read. And not just read what Mark Moore says about the, the passage each week, but read the passage, the, the gospel passage, the New Testament passages, the Old Testament passages, and watch how God's story unfolds, the seamless theme from beginning to end of Scripture that points us to Jesus who desires relationship with us for eternity. That's why he's done everything he's done. Because he wants to hang out with you not just for you to know some facts about him. So in light of all of that, Jesus reveals his divinity to the disciples. He's passing by them, this picture of God revealing himself. And then the language he uses to say, it's me, to say, I am, in the Greek is, ego, a me, ego, a me. Now, normally in the Greek language, if somebody said, hey, it's me, they would just say, a me. This is like, it's kind of scaled down version. Because a go a me is a very formal way of saying it. And if, if someone were to say a go a me, it would be like, well, that's blasphemy because you're kind of taking the name of God in that. And the way Jesus said it and the context in which Jesus said it, he's saying, I am. Again, we go back to a story with Moses. Moses had left Israel or had left Egypt. The Israelites were there. They were under captivity of, of the Pharaoh and Moses has been out for 40 years and he's tending some sheep and he sees a bush that's on fire, the famous story of a bush that's on fire but doesn't consume. And the bush starts talking to him and tells him, yo, Mo, go back to Pharaoh. Tell him, let my people go. Moses is like, hey, bro, who should I tell him? All right. Listen, I know that's, go with me, I'm a dad. You're not gonna forget that part now, right? Do the rhyme, it sticks in your brain. It's good, all right? 
Because Moses is like, listen, if I tell him a bush that was on fire, it's going to be like, dude, that was a bad acid trip. You ate some bad mushrooms. He's like, I need something more. And so he's like, what am I supposed to do with this? And God says, I am. Whoa. Now, we, we just miss it because in our culture, in our language, it doesn't have the weight. When God says, I am, tell them the I am sent you. For the Hebrew, that is like the weightiest thing you can hear. I am, like the one who created and sustains and is the God who was and is forever before we existed and after all this is gone, I am. Let them know that's who sent you. Oh, okay, now we're good. So Moses goes to Pharaoh, hey, let the people go. Pharaoh says no. Moses says, listen, bro, you better let him go. And all that stuff happens. And then the exodus and on and on. Thousands years later, here we are, Jesus back in the boat with the guys. Jesus climbs into the boat with these guys. And what we see is that courage comes. Let's go back to that. Let's pass it. When he says, take courage, it's me. I am. He is passing by a picture of Moses. He is speaking. I am a picture of what God says to Moses. And here we go. What we see, he says, take courage and don't be afraid because I am God and I am near. And courage is not something we muster up within ourselves. Courage does not come from what we have and who we are. Courage comes from knowing who your God is and knowing he is near to you. Courage comes from knowing that if God is for you, who can stand against you? If God is for you, which he is, because the cross speaks that he is for you, not against you. That he came to rescue you and not to condemn you. That he loves you and he desires relationship with you. And when you recognize who God is and that he is near you have courage. You need not fear anything else. Like That's good news, church. So Jesus climbs into the boat with these guys. And the wind stopped, and they were totally amazed, for they still did not understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. Now, a hardened heart in Scripture, in the biblical context, sometimes, oftentimes means because our sin has hardened us so much in a rebellion against God, We've built up these calluses, these spiritual calluses against God to the point where we don't let God break through. But sometimes the hardened heart is simply because of, yes, the ongoing sin in our lives, but also the brokenness of the world around us that has so confused us and misled us. And we just have lost the fertility of the heart soil that God's got to break through. So church, here's the deal. Make sure you are cultivating a sensitivity for the Holy Spirit to be able to speak to you. Be willing to relinquish your pride. Be willing to relinquish your stubbornness. Be willing to consider that the things you hold most near and dear are the very things God might say, that's an idol and you need to give it up. If you want to know the strongest idols in your life, just start giving stuff away. And the things that you can't let go of, that's the place God wants to do some work in your soul. And so their hearts are hard. But what I love is that Jesus comes near, he gets into the boat, even when they don't understand, even when their hearts are hard. And that's really great news for us, church, because here's why. Too often we get in our minds that God is only gonna come near to us. God's only gonna show us his glory. God's only gonna show up. God's only gonna reveal himself when we get it all together, when we are righteous enough, when we're holy enough, when we're doing all the right things. If I'm praying enough, if I'm reading my Bible enough, if I'm giving enough away, if I'm serving enough, if I'm grouping enough, if I'm telling enough other people about Jesus, if I'm doing whatever it might be. And the problem is we can never do enough because that's empty, false religion that Jesus came to break down in the first place. He said it's not about the doing of those things. It's about being. It's about being the child of God and being in relationship with him. Not that doing isn't part of it, but the doing comes on the backside, not the front side. You don't earn God's favor. You don't become God's favor by doing. It's all what Jesus did for us on the cross. So you come to him and you be his child. And listen, those things, the the giving and the serving and the grouping and the reading and the praying, those are not bad things. In fact, those things can help us see more clearly who God is and what he's up to. But they can become bad things when we make it all about those things and all about our performance instead of about the relationship and cultivating a soft heart to hear God's voice. So Jesus comes near. You know, Jesus will come near to you even when you are pummeled by the winds and the waves and the storm. 
Now notice how Mark in his gospel ties the miracle of Jesus walking on the water to the miracle of Jesus multiplying the food. He said, Jesus climbs into the boat, the wind stops, which reminds them of a time this has happened before. Remember last week we were talking, if you were with us, they're in the storm, Jesus is asleep, the fishermen are like, we're gonna die, Jesus, wake up. And you know it's bad when they wake the preacher up to like save the boat. And Jesus is like, ah, storm, quiet, I'm napping. And it calms. Jesus steps into the boat, calms down again. They're like, oh, yeah, who is this man, right? And they were totally amazed, for they still did not understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Right, well, Jesus just walked on water, and Mark's like, hey, remember the, remember the loaves, how he fed everybody? And he's drawn these things together. Because when Jesus walked on water, he was revealing so much to the disciples, because they did not yet understand They understood that Jesus broke some bread and multiplied it to satisfy the hunger of the people. They did not yet understand that Jesus himself is the bread of life that would be broken to satisfy our spiritual hunger and our sin need. They understood that Jesus had power. They did not yet understand that Jesus is power. They understood that Jesus was from God. They did not yet understand that Jesus is God. And so here, Jesus is revealing this. He's opening their eyes. He's helping them see. Remember what Jesus did when the disciples gave him the bread? He took the five loaves and two fish, looked to heaven, blessed them, then broke the loaves and kept giving to the disciples so they could give to others. He gave thanks and he broke it. Here, Mark uses almost the exact same language to foreshadow what happens in the Last Supper. The night before Jesus is crucified, he and the disciples are celebrating the Jewish Passover meal, like this sacred holy meal together. And it's not just a meal of bread and wine. There's like this actual full robust feast that they're eating. But in that meal, the bread and the wine become most significant because in that meal, this is how Mark records it. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. Now, He's speaking euphemistically. This is not literally my body. He couldn't literally be his body because he's still standing there in the flesh with him. He's saying, this is representative of me. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood, again, using hyperbole. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Jesus, on that beach side with the thousands of people, broke the bread, and multiplied it so everyone could eat. On the cross, his body broken, but the blessing multiplied so all could receive. Jesus, on that beach side with the thousands of people, in the midst of his own sorrow and his own grief at the death of his friend and cousin, still had compassion for the people and ministered to their needs. Jesus, on the cross, awaiting his own imminent death, having been tortured and beaten and nailed to a cross. In his own pain, and his own sorrow, cries out to the Father in compassion for the people, Father God, forgive them because they just don't understand. So often we just don't understand. There's so many beautiful parallels here in Mark's gospel, what Mark is revealing to us. When you came in today, you received a cup like this. I want you to flip it upside down. Put the cup on bottom, the bread, which is on bottom. Go ahead and take the bread and hold that in your hands. Because every week here at Oklahoma Christian, we celebrate in remembrance what Jesus did in that last supper with his disciples. So hold the bread in your hand and remember what Jesus said. This is my body broken for you. And we invite, we, we practice what's called open communion here. We invite anyone and everyone who would say that they have surrendered to Jesus as the leader in their life, that they have celebrated in Jesus that he is the rescuer of their soul. We invite you, if that's you, to participate with us. And, and in this, I just want to offer some prompts to guide our thoughts for the next moment. And then we're gonna pray together. We'll we'll eat and drink together in a moment. But at this moment, you go ahead and bow in prayer. 
And thank God for his compassion on you, even in the midst of his pain. In this moment, reflect on the tragedy of the cross. That the innocent, sinless Son of God died in our place, the death we deserved. And celebrate the triumph of the empty grave of a risen Savior who's alive still today. With this bread in your hand, eat and remember Christ's body broken for you for the forgiveness of sin. with this cup, remember Christ's blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. God, as we taste of that bread, we taste of that juice, we thank you, we celebrate you. that it wasn't just your blood that poured out, but it's your mercy, it's your grace, it's your forgiveness to offer restoration, redemption for all who would turn to you as Lord and as Savior. That we walk in a new life, a forever life, because you surrendered your life on the cross, but you rose triumphant over the grave and you reign forever as king, as Lord. But we can know you as friend. So we praise you because you and you alone are worthy and deserving of all our praise. And all God's people said, amen. Well, part of the beauty and the genius of what Jesus was doing in those moments was that we are to receive blessing but also to be a conduit, to be a pipeline of blessing for others. We return to when Jesus took those five loaves, the two fish, he broke, he looked, heaven gave thanks and then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to people. He kept giving. They had to give away and then he continued to put more in their hands and they gave and he continued to put more. Everyone was fed, everyone had their fill and there were still leftovers. They received to give, they received to give. And that's the picture of blessing in God's kingdom. That's the picture of what it's supposed to be. You remember when the disciples noticed, hey, it's getting late, Jesus, you've been talking for a long time. These people are getting hungry. I know, you're feeling the same thing, right? And it's like, hey, let them go, let, let them go get some food. And what Jesus said, like, and that's what we're supposed to do. We see a need, we bring it to Jesus. We prayerfully say, Jesus, here's a need right in front of me. I see this need. And we're supposed to do that. But you remember what Jesus said? He said, oh yeah, you go feed them. You meet that need. So just get ready because here's the deal. We are supposed, as God's people, we're supposed to look around us with eyes open to see the needs around us. But when we see the need, we're to meet the need. I think we had a slide for that. When you see the need, meet the need. When you see the need, meet the need. When you see the need, bring it to Jesus. Say, Jesus, here's the need. But remember what Jesus said. He said, all right, you go feed them. I'm like, we don't have enough. So yeah, we are probably gonna wrestle with God sometimes. I don't have enough food. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough supplies. I don't have enough resources. God, I can't meet that need. I don't have enough. And God says, you put it in my hands. Get it out of yours. Loosen your grip. Open up your hands. You'll have more than you need. And I'll bless you also. 
So you see the need, you meet the need, you put it in God's hands, he's gonna multiply, and he will do amazing things in you and through you and for you. And what a blessing that is. So church, allow God to multiply whatever you have to meet whatever needs you see. And let me make the application this week super, super simple. I've been talking about food. It's almost lunchtime. Here's your assignment for the week. Go feed someone. Go feed someone. Provide a meal for someone. And maybe the way you're gonna do that is to partner in with the food pantry. Uh, maybe you'll jump in and start serving in the food pantry. Or maybe you'll take a friend or a family member, you'll go to the store, you'll buy some food, and you'll bring it in, and you'll, you, you'll just bless the pantry with it so they have what they need. Maybe you'll buy some food and some essentials and some toiletries, and you'll just keep a bag in your car, and when you see that person who's holding the sign on the side of the road, you'll, you'll actually give that to him and say, hey, here's, here's something, I hope this helps. Maybe you see that person and you say, hey, well, why don't we go down the street because there's a, there's a restaurant right there and, and you treat that person to a meal. And it's just one meal. But that one meal might be the game changer. And, and maybe you just, in, just invite them to share their story with you. But maybe it's a neighbor who you invite over to your house for a meal. If you cook like me, maybe you provide a meal from somewhere else. I don't know. Maybe it's that, that coworker and you treat him to lunch and, and at lunch you share your story of what God has been up to in your life or you just invite them to share their story of how their life has gone and you get to know them better. Maybe if you're one of those people who loves to make food and loves to make meals, you can bring them out. I'm just kidding. If you love to make meals, we've got some ministries that partner up with that all the time. All the time, there, there's sporting events at Southern High School and they love to have people come in and provide food for their students because some of their students just don't have time to go home and eat a meal before the sport. And some of the students don't have the means to, to run across the street and even grab some fast food. And so we bless them. But maybe it's you know making a meal for Sycamore Farm, a ministry we partner with that all the time is taking good meals to women who are stuck in the sex industry. Now listen, guys, you can make that meal. You are not allowed to deliver that meal. There's a lot of protection we want to put on there, so we set some boundaries. You guys can help make, but you can't deliver. But the women go in and they provide these meals to those women, so they get to just let those women know you are loved, you are cared for, you are seen, you are valued, and God loves you, and so do we. All the time, you, uh, InterVarsity down at UofL, it's a ministry we partner with, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. It's providing meals for college students on the nights that they meet for their, their ministry. And they provide these meals and those students come, they eat a meal and it just helps them. Like one less thing they have to worry about, they get to interact with people, they know they're loved and they get to hear about Jesus. We got a group of gals here who've been doing that, I think for over two decades, providing meals to that group. But if you wanna jump in on one of those, you wanna provide a meal, then you just stop by the next step spot in the lobby and you say, I'm, I'm ready to jump in and provide a meal for one of those ministries. How do I help? We'll get your info, we'll connect you. It'll be a beautiful thing. But you don't have to make it complicated. Just see a need and meet the need and trust God to provide whatever you have. And, and if you're joining us and you've never surrendered to Jesus, listen, Jesus longs to dine with you in the great feast of eternity. The book of Revelation tells us that when we step into eternity, we, we feast with him. So he wants, he wants you there in that meal. But the only way there is to surrender yourself, to acknowledge that he is leader and he is rescuer. And if you're ready to make that decision, you're here today, meet us in the Next Steps area after this. You're joining us online in real time or any time during the week. You simply holler at the host or you call the church office and we'll come meet with you and we'll help you walk through surrendering to Jesus and all the beauty of what comes from that. Well, church, let's pray. But here's, here's one more thing, actually, one more thing. All the time, we, we send you guys out we say, hey, this is, this is the application for the week. I'm gonna remind you where we began today's message. Jesus had sent the disciples out. They came back and they reported to Jesus what they'd been doing. So I'm gonna invite you. Let us know how it goes. Like, let's all go out and provide a meal this week. Who's in with me? 
Who was willing to provide the meal this week? All right, awesome. Do me a favor. Call the church office and, and just share with us your story. Hey, I, I had this meal. Here's how it went. Shoot me an email, fits at oklahonacc.org. You can find my, my email on the church website. If you forget, it's real easy. My name and the church. Shoot me an email. I'll pass it to the team. We want to hear your stories of sharing your story. We want to hear your stories of sharing the meal because this is what we want to do. We want to celebrate with you what God is up to in your life. The disciples came back. They were so excited. Look what God did through us. As you provide that meal, as you meet those needs, share with us so we can celebrate with you. Will you do that? All right, let's pray. God, we are grateful that you are the one who ultimately meets all the needs we have. And sometimes you do things radical and miraculous, like walking on water and multiplying the food. And sometimes you just meet us right where we are in a super simple way. But God, ultimately you are, you are God. You are the great I am. And you're the one who provides for every need we have because you are the one who desires that we would spend eternity with you. And so we celebrate that. We are grateful for that. We thank you for that. And so God, we pray that as we stand and as we sing this last song, that you hear these words of our hearts as praise, as honor, that you and you alone deserve as we celebrate you. In Jesus we pray, amen. Church, let's stand and let's celebrate our risen King.